some of the work actually began here in the Weha in the, that sort of uh, not late 80s uh, period when, when Ian was actually at the Weha. So it's great to have him back, and uh, thank you very much, Ian. Thank you, John. It's always a, a, a real pleasure to be able to come back to the alma mater, I must say. Whoop. So, yeah, it, as John said, I was uh, here many, many years ago um, working in the Burnett Clinical Research Unit with Len Harrison. There's Len. We both uh, had a bit more hair and it was a different colour back then too. Anyway, um, as John said, my interest in, in the type 1 interferons in autoimmune disease actually started while I was working here at the WEHI. Um, Len and I had embarked on a research project looking at the pathogenetic mechanisms that underlie type 1 uh, insulin-dependent diabetes. And at the time, the prevailing hypothesis was that viruses played a key role in initiating type 1 diabetes, and that's how we ended up becoming interested in the type 1 interferons. Um, because the type 1 interferons, of course, as we'll see in the lecture, and you probably already know, play a key role in antiviral defence. Um, I've continued to work on the type 1 interferons all those years. And um, when I went to Scripps Research Institute, my interests focused uh, changed to the central nervous system. And, and, um, and I want to thank um, Emma Stewart and Sandra Nicholson for giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you a little bit today about what I think is a, a really interesting and emerging area in our understanding of autoimmunity and perhaps um, autoinflammatory disease. And that is the role of the, um, the host anti-DNA response and the generation of type 1 interferons as key mediators of tissue injury and damage. And it really all started in this um, remarkable paper, really, um, that was reported um, back in 1984 by um, Francois uh, Gutier and Jean Accardet. And, and they observed in eight infants this progressive familial encephalopathy, which uh, one of the striking features of which was the presence of calcifications in the basal ganglia and a um, lymphocytic um, uh, infiltrates or, or lymphocytes present in the CSF. And this was quite a, um, a, a nasty encephalopathy that resulted in shrinking of the brain, significant brain atrophy, um, marked motor disorder, and eventually the, the death of the infants. And this was the key to it. This was a, a, a disease that was occurring in infants, and not only was it in infants, but it was also a familial disorder. Now, this particular disorder at the time had all of the hallmarks of a mimic of congenital viral infection. And if you look at the symptoms of and the pathology pathological changes in the brain of chronic um, viral infection in infants, you'll see that it's almost identical to this. But the big difference with this familial encephalopathy was that it appeared to be a hereditary disorder. Then, about four years later, um, Accardet and Gutierre, working with Pierre Le Bon, showed that all of these patients had very high levels of type 1 interferon present in their CSF. And this disorder became known as the Accardé Gutierrez syndrome, or AGS. So many, many years went by. Um, it was not really understood why these patients had high levels of type 1 interferon present in their CSF, and the relationship between the type 1 interferon and the actual disease in, in these patients was not really understood at all. But then there were a couple of really quite important breakthrough papers that came out in Nature Genetics in 2006 um, from the group of Yannick Crow. Yannick Crow is an immunogeneticist, and he was very interested in identifying the genes that were responsible for Accardé Gutierrez syndrome. And he embarked upon this um, for many, many years before, and he, we actually had many communications during that time as, uh, as uh, um, Yannick tried to um, extract as much information from me about inflammation in the CNS and uh, the role that that plays because we um, had generated, as you'll see, a transgenic mouse that produces type 1 interferon in the brain. Anyway, as a result of the studies by Yannick Crow, they identified two mutations that occurred in individuals with AGS. Now, I have to say that AGS is a monogenic disorder. 
And as we'll see, a number of other mutations have been identified that appear to be closely associated with the development of um, Akade Gutierrez syndrome. So one of these uh, mutations was identified in this uh, gene encoding the ribonuclease H2, while the other was um, discovered to be in the gene encoding the 3 prime 5 prime DNA exonuclease TREX1. Subsequently, if I can get to the slide, subsequently, Yannick Crow went on to characterize further mutations that are associated with AGS. And I've just listed these in the table. So here's TREX1 and RNAs H2. Now, it turns out that there are three different genes encoding uh, three different isoforms of RNAs, 2A, 2B, and 2C. And there were patients found with mutations in either these other two uh, genes for the RNAs H2. And then more recently, this um, SAM domain, HD1 domain protein, SAM HD1, and finally, the most recent mutation identified is in a gene called adenosine deaminase um, acting on RNA, or ADAR. Each one of these genes is associated with um, AGS, as I indicated, and has been given the locus AGS1 through AGS6, as illustrated here. Now, if we look at the function of these genes, it emerges there's quite an interesting theme. The TREX1, as I said, is a three-prime exonuclease. It's very important in the degradation of single-stranded DNA that forms in the lag, uh, lagging strand of RNA replication. It also plays a very important role in um, DNA repair. The RNAs H2s are um, involved in processing RNA DNA hybrids. These RNA DNA hybrids form during um, DNA repair. SAMHD1 is an important enzyme that degrades deoxynucleoside triphosphates. And again, these DNPs play a critical role in nucleic acid synthesis um, and uh, during replication and also in um, repair. And then finally, the adenosine deaminase as a hydro, uh, performs hydrolytic deamination of adenosine to inosine in double-stranded RNA. And the common theme that comes out of all of this study of the, the mutations associated with the AGS is that these enzymes are all involved at different levels in nucleic acid metabolism. Now, at the same time that the, Yannick Crow and his colleagues were identifying these mutations, uh, germline knockout mice were being developed that had targeted mutations of the different AGS genes. And the very first of these mice that was generated was a TREX1 knockout. The TREX1 knockout mouse um, develops a progressive and uh, fatal inflammatory myocarditis with acto uh, autoimmune activation. It's quite interesting that although this animal develops this severe autoimmune activation associated with the myocardium, it doesn't develop any neurological disease. It's subsequently been shown that the autoimmune disease in TREX1 knockout mice is IRF3 and sting dependent, and I'll come back to this, but importantly, it's driven by type 1 interferon. So if the TREX1 knockout mice are crossed onto mice that lack the type 1 interferon receptor. They're protected from this autoimmune uh, myocarditis disease. Now, there have been knockouts in many of these other genes, the ADR1, which is embryonic lethal, but interestingly enough, analysis of the tissues of these mice show they have what's called an interferon signature. I'll come back to that and explain what an inter I mean by an interferon signature again. Uh, in the case of the... RNAs H knockout, not all of the isoforms have been knocked out, but in the one that has been knocked out, again, it's embryonic lethal. Um, and there's evidence of a marked DNA damage response, although no obvious interferon involvement in this particular animal. And then finally, the SAM HD1. These animals are healthy, but they show increased sen uh, sensitivity to adapted HIV. And again, in the tissues of these animals, there's evidence of an interferon signature. And this is a, another important theme that I'll come back to, but as we begin to better understand the function of these nucleic acid metabolizing enzymes, 
It's clear that they appear to all, at some level, have an important role in defence against HIV-1, and I'll come back to that. Now, as I said, TREX-1 was the first of these animals that was knocked out, and we have the greatest understanding of the pathogenesis of the auto-inflammatory or autoimmune disease that takes place in these animals. So I'm going to focus somewhat more on the TREX-1 story because I think that it's very instructive in terms of understanding what might be going on in the Accade Gutierrez syndrome or AGS. So another very important paper in this area came out from Deborah Barnes' group in 2007 and they made the observation that TREX-1 um, plays a key role in the degradation of sub double stranded, uh, sorry, single stranded DNA. And what they observed, interestingly enough, is in cells that are taken from these mice, you know, mouse fibroblast cells from the TREX1 knockouts, when you compare them with cells taken from wild type, they looked at the levels of single stranded DNA. And you can see here the presence of single stranded DNA in this immunofluorescence. Um, uh, analysis, and they could show that this was um, nucleic acid because if they treated the cells with S1 nuclease, you gradually lost the single-stranded DNA in a dose-dependent fashion. Now, another interesting observation from these studies, if you look at it, you can see quite clear, clearly is that the single-stranded DNA is actually not in the nucleus but it's in the cytoplasm, and it, indeed it co-localizes with the endoplasmic reticulum. And this turns out to be the primary uh, intracellular location of TREX1 as well. So it appears that in the absence of TREX1 in the cells that undergoing um, normal DNA replication, that lagging strand of single-stranded DNA, which is normally degraded by TREX1, accumulates within the nucleus and then is translocated out into the cytoplasm where it accumulates in the absence of TREX1. Now, um, in this same paper, they observed that there was a very, very low level of TREX1 in the nucleus. So TREX1 appears to be also present in the nucleus where obviously it's got to degrade that um, single-stranded DNA that's formed during DNA replication. This process of accumulation of the single-stranded DNA actually uh, increases markedly if the cells are injured by UV light or hydroxyurea, which damage DNA and induce DNA repair. So again, indicating the critical role that TREX1 plays in those particular processes. Now, a very important observation that they made at the time was they were able to obtain fibroblasts from... Um, people who are healthy or from patients with AGS1. So AGS1 is the mutation in the TREX1. And what they showed was that in these uh, fibroblasts taken from patients with H1 compared with wild type, there was an accumulation of single-stranded DNA with, uh, in the cytoplasm, as you can see here. And again, showing that formally that this was nucleic acid treatment with S1 nuclease in blue here, led to a degradation or loss of, of that single-stranded DNA or nucleic acid signal um, shown here by flow cytometry. So these studies uh, critically showed that at least in the case of uh, TREX1, one of the major defects is the accumulation within the cytoplasm of single-stranded DNA. Then, uh, more recently, Daniel Stetson and his group uh, have gone on to look at the role that these enzymes play in the degradation of uh, endogenous retroviruses. Now, as I mentioned, there's accumulating evidence that each one of these enzymes probably has an important role in defence against HIV, uh, and this is through regulation or, or degradation at different levels of the life cycle of the retrovirus, in particular during the reverse transcription um, stage of replication. Now, of course, uh, approximately 50% of the human genome consists of uh, retroviral elements, and these retroviral elements are uh, replicating at different stages uh, in response to injury, but also spontaneously. And it's thought that these enzymes play an important role in degrading the uh, retroviral or retroelement DNA as it's formed during reverse transcription. So what Stetson 
and colleagues have postulated in this review is that the AGS-related enzymes restrict replication of endogenous retroelements and exogenous retroviruses, and that this plays a critical role in stimulating the innate immune response. Now, they have come to this hypothesis from this earlier study in which they again looked in the TREX1 knockout mice, and they looked at the character of the nucleic acid that was accumulating in the myocardium of these mice. So this is not the fibroblast. Deborah Barnes' group were looking specifically at fibroblasts from these mice. What Stetson's group did was look directly at the myocardium, which is the focus of the autoimmune or autoinflammatory assault in these particular mice. And what, what they observed was that most of the single-stranded DNA that was present within the myocardium of TREX1 knockout mice was actually retrovirally derived. And this is just indicated here in this pie diagram showing this large amount of uh, retroviral DNA compared with the wild-type cells. And the relative percentage of these can be seen down here. I haven't got my glasses on, so I can't really read that very well, but you can see what it is, 25 versus 5. And these diagrams here just show using site-specific P, uh, primers and PCR where the uh, actual retroelement DNA were derived from in these uh, retroviral genomes. And again, you can see that there's a preponderance of um, DNA elements derived from the open reading frames in particular of these endogenous retroelements. So as I said, this led um, Stetson and colleagues to propose that in TREX1 deficiency, it's actually the accumulation of retroelement DNA that is uh, a critical defect in the cells and that TREX1 plays a, a major role in the defense uh, by degrading host defense, by degrading the, um, the retroviral DNA. So this obviously begged the question then if, if these retroelements or retroviral genome play an important role in the pathogenesis of the disease process in TREX1, is that um, sensitive to therapeutic intervention using antiretroviral drugs. And in 2011, a paper reported that indeed treatment of these TREX1 knockout mice with a combined antiretroviral drug therapy led to significant protection, as illustrated here, compared with the non-treated uh, mice, Com significant protection against uh, myocardial disease and prolonged the life of the mice, and was also shown to lead to a marked reduction in the presence of um, viral nucleic acid illustrated here by flow at following different uh, dosage regimes in these animals. And you can see at the high dose of the antiretroviral therapy, there was almost a complete um, loss of, of the retroviral genome in the hearts of these mice. So this was proof of concept, if you like, that um, yes, there is an accumulation of these retro elements within the cells in TREX1 deficient animals, and that to that blocking that process with antiretroviral drugs um, can have a significant therapeutic effect in mice, uh, in these TREX1 knockout mice. So the, I guess the question then is, what was the basis for this increased production of interferon alpha in AGS, and how might the AGS in activating mutations in nucleic acid metabolizing genes be involved in this process. And again, we go back to this uh, landmark paper from Pierre Le Bon in which they um, showed that patients with AGS have high levels of um, interferon alpha. So what's the link here with, with these particular mutations? Well, in parallel with these developments in the AGS field, of course, was the emerging field of understanding the driving force behind innate immunity. And that driving force is reliant on the cell's ability to be able to sense danger in its environment. And this danger that's sensed in the environment can be attributed to classes of receptors known as pattern recognition receptors that play a key role in the recognition of uh, danger signals, if you like. Now, there are a number of different classes of pattern recognition receptors. I believe that you may have already had a lecture in this series on um, 
the pattern recognition receptors and the, their role in driving innate immunity. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but we probably all know about the toll-like receptors, uh, the NOD proteins, and of course the RNA helicases, which are all classical pattern recognition receptors that play a crucial role in host defense um, through innate sensing of danger signals. These danger signals can either be pathogen-associated molecular patterns, which are derived from viruses, bacteria, or pathogenic microorganisms, but they can also be modified host proteins and nucleic acids, and these are known as DAMPs. The common process involved in, with all of these receptors following recognition of either PAMP or DAMPS is the activation of signal transduction pathways that then drive the innate immune response. Now, because the TREX-1 knockout might show an accumulation of single-stranded DNA and of retro elements, it has been much focused in trying to define the linkage between that process and the autoimmune disease in the myocardium. And that focus has led to the discovery that the DNA sensors, pattern recognition receptors that recognize DNA, are likely the most crucial sensors that um, drive this process. And again, I'm not going to go into too much detail with this because, as I understand, you've already had a lecture on... Um, uh, pattern recognition receptors in innate signaling. But what we now know is that there are a significant number of these pattern uh, of DNA sensing pattern recognition receptors, uh, such as DDX41, if it's 16, CGAS, and STING being some of the more recently identified DNA sensors. STING, in fact, appears to be uh, critical for sensing by all these different pattern recognition receptors. Sting itself is able to bind DNA, so it appears to have pattern recognition receptor function. S Sting also serves as a platform, if you like, or an adapter that links the sensing by these other DNA um, pattern recognition receptors to the downstream signal transduction pathways. Sting itself is tethered to the endoplasmic reticulum. And that um, association of sting with the endoplasmic reticulum is absolutely critical for its function. If the um, tether of sting to the endoplasmic reticulum is removed um, in, in the soluble state in the cytoplasm, sting no longer is able to perform its function of activating signal transduction. So this platform of association between sting and the ER is critical. So as I said, sting serves as a key intermediate in this innate response following the sensing of DNA by these pattern recognition receptors. They activate sting. This leads to the activation of downstream signal transduction pathways and key transcription factors that drive pro-inflammatory mediator gene expression. And one of these transcription factors is IGF3, so, uh, sorry, IRF3, which is interferon regulatory factor 3. IRF3 is phosphorylated and forms homodimers that translocate to the nucleus and drive type 1 interferon gene expression. So could this be the link between the production or the overproduction of the single-stranded DNA in TREX1 uh, mutant cells to the overproduction of type 1 interferon and the dependence on type 1 interferon of the disease that occurs in those particular mice? Well, the answer appears to be yes. Again, in studies done by Daniel Stetson and his colleagues, they took TREX1 knockout mice and they interbred them with sting knockout mice and showed that these animals were protected from myocardial disease and all of the autoimmune phenomena. In addition, they showed that these mice no longer had elevated levels of type 1 interferon. So it appears that in the TREX1 knockout state that the accumulation of single-stranded DNA and retroelement DNA is able to activate a DNA sensor that is coupled to the activation of sting that then signals via the signal transduction pathways to elevate interferon alpha and drive this autoimmune response in the heart. 
Now, obviously, a, an important question here is why is the heart particularly sensitive? And why isn't the CNS involved? A Cardi Goutier syndrome is a neurological disease, an inflammatory encephalopathy. Patients with AGS don't appear to have si significant myocardial disease. So the interesting question is what determines the tissue specificity, and we really don't have the answer for that the current time, whether this may reflect differences in um, the emergence of retro elements in those tissues, it's not really known. So this appears to be an important, um, or, or appears to, to, to provide a good rationale for now for understanding the pathogenesis of AGS and its linkage to these enzymes that all play a key role in nucleic acid metabolism. And it's, it's now believed that the defects in each one of these enzymes results in the accumulation of unprocessed self-nucleic acids and or retroelements that activate nucleic acid centers, leading to the activation of innate and immune signaling and leading to the increase in interferon alpha. Now, a lot of this, as I said, has been deduced from the studies in those TREX1 knockout mice wrong way. It's now clear that in addition to AGS, there are a number of uh, these monogenic so-called interferonopathies. And I've just um, taken this table from Yannick Crow's review here in the annual uh, Annals of the New York Academy of Science in 2011. I've just looked at um, PubMed this morning coming down on the plane, and there's yet another one that his group has just uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So it appears that there are a number of these monogenic interferonopathies with mutations that affect these uh, key nucleic acid uh, metabolizing enzymes. So, of course, the big question is, are these really interferonopathies? Does interferon alpha have any causative roles in these disorders? In the TREX1, knockout mice, it clearly does, because if you cross TREX1 knockout mice, as I said, with IFNA knockout mice that are unable to respond to type 1 interferon, those animals are protected from disease. So what about the brain? And that's what we're, we were particularly interested in. Uh, at the time we did our studies, um, Akade and Gutierre had just described um, the Akade Gutierre syndrome. Now, I'll just give you a very brief background to the interferons, particularly the type 1 interferons. I gather that um, Paul Herzog also spoke here a couple of weeks ago, so I probably don't need to go into too much detail here, and I don't want time to get a ahead of me. So, so I'll be fairly brief um, and just remind you that interferon was first discovered way back in 1957 as a biological property that inhibited the uh, replication of influenza virus. This term was uh, interferon was given because of that biological property to interfere with uh, viral replication by Isaac, Isaacs and Lindemann, first reported here in the Proceedings of the Royal Society um, of Biology. And this was way back in 1957, I guess, for many of you students here, that's well before you were born. <laughs> Not before me, unfortunately. <laughs> So the interferons now we, we now know consist of uh, a large family of um, proteins that can be further subdivided into the type 1, the type 2, and the type 3 interferons. The type 1 interferons, there are multiple members. There are approximately 13 isoforms of interferon alpha in humans. There's a single interferon beta, a single interferon omega, and a single interferon Tau. And I didn't put Paul Herzog's favorite type 1 interferon here, interferon epsilon, but you know all about that. Um, type 2 interferon is represented by a single uh, member, interferon gamma, of course, and the type 3 uh, interferons more recently discovered, known as interferon lambdas. There are two or three members of, of this subgroup. Uh, the type 1 interferons um, produced by a diverse range of cells, but they all bind to a common receptor. All of the interferons have antiviral, um, antibacterial, antitumor, immunoregulatory and pro-inflammatory properties. Now, the signaling for type 1 interferons is very 
well understood, or at least it was till recently when Paul Herzog's group um, confounded the field. I don't know whether he spoke about that in his talk, but I'm just going to present you with the classical um, type 1 interferon signaling pathway in which interferon alpha or beta uh, bind to a heterodimeric uh, transmembrane protein known as the IFNA. This consists of the IFNA1 and IFNA2C um, subunits. This leads to the activation of receptor-associated Janus kinases, known as TIC2 and JAK1. These Janus kinases are tyrosine kinases. In addition to phosphorylating each other, they phosphorylate tyrosine residues on the intracellular chain of the IFNA, and this sets up docking sites for latent cytoplasmic transcription factors, in particular in the case of type 1 interferon signaling STAT2 and STAT1. These STATs uh, bind via SH2 domains to these phosphotyrosine residues on the intracellular chain of the receptor, where they're then phosphorylated by the Janus kinases. These STATs then dissociate from the receptor and form this heterodimer. The heterodimer translocates into the nucleus and it associates with a third protein known as interferon regulatory factor 9 to form a trimolecular complex known as the interferon stimulated gene factor 3. And it's this trimolecular complex that is the active transcriptional uh, component of this signaling pathway and it binds to specific DNA response elements in the promoters of interferon target genes. These response elements are known as the interferon stimulated response element or ISREs. This then has a profound effect on the transcriptional program of the cell leading to the induction of a large number of genes that are known as interferon-regulated genes. There are also a, a smaller subset of genes that are down-regulated, and these are also part of the interferon-regulated genes, of course. Needless to say, this transcriptional output of the cell has, become, has come to be known as the interferon signature, and really is a very good diagnostic for the presence of type 1 interferons in tissues. And of course, it's the change in these interferon-regulated genes that mediate the biological actions of the type 1 interferons. And these biological actions, as I indicated, uh, play a key role in antiviral de defense. Many of the gene products of these interferon-regulated genes have direct effects to inhibit viral replication in cells. And yet, a large number of the interferon-regulated genes, while not having direct antiviral properties, are able to modulate the antiviral immune response. So this is, in essence, how the type 1 interferons are, are able to signal and mediate changes in the cellular uh, transcriptome. Now, the obvious question in relation to AGS, and what we were particularly interested in, is the role that type 1 interferons may play in the central nervous system, and in particular, in mediating injury in the CNS. So, in regard to the central nervous system, um, type 1 interferons are really undetectable. There, there is, uh, we know that there are uh, very low levels of type 1 interferons there. Um, there is some homeostatic signaling that takes place, and you can demonstrate that quite easily in IFNA knockout mice, where you do see... Uh, changes in the basal levels of interferon-regulated genes. So we know that homeostatic signaling takes place, but nevertheless, um, it's very difficult to detect the presence of type 1 interferons in a healthy brain. However, following viral infection, you get quite significant uh, production of type 1 interferons in the brain, and as I'll show you, uh, most cells in the brain are capable of producing type 1 interferons following a viral infection. We know also now that type 1 interferons, of course, are increased in Akade Goudier syndrome, but type 1 interferons can be found elevated in a number of other uh, disorders of the central nervous system, infection, of course, but also in autoimmune diseases such as SLE encephalopathy. This is a bit of a cheating, I think, putting this here because I think we now know that patients that develop SLE encephalopathy probably are variants of the Akade Goudier syndrome, and nearly all these patients have TREX1 uh, mutations. 
Neurodegeneration, Peter Crack very kindly came along to hear my presentation today and Peter and his group just reported recently that there's a type 1 interferon signaling in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease. And I think it's quite likely that we're going to see type 1 interferons um, involved in a number of disorders of the CNS where you get any sort of cellular injury or any sort of um, abnormal production of metabolic species such as proteins that occurs in Alzheimer's disease where you get misfolded proteins. So we can expect, I think, to see the type 1 interferons have a much wider role in uh, CNS disease. Now, the first hints that type 1 interferons actually may be toxic to the brain came in therapeutic studies. Um, type 1 interferons have been used uh, extensively in the clinic for the treatment of uh, chronic viral infections, but also for the treatment of tumour. And it turns out that one of the, the major limiting factors to the effectiveness of the use of type 1 interferons in the clinic is their neurotoxicity. Uh, this can be so extreme that it leads to coma and death in um, certain patients. So there, as I said, been an observation around for a long time that the CNS appears to be very sensitive to the toxic effects of uh, systemically administered type 1 interferons. Paradoxically, though, type 1 interferons have been shown to be beneficial and have a therapeutic benefit in multiple sclerosis. Um, what we know is that the, the doses of type 1 interferon that's effective in multiple sclerosis are far lower than those that we use to treat viral diseases and anti-tumor responses. So again, they've got this dose-dependent beneficial versus de detrimental effect. And at low concentrations, at least, or low doses, um, type 1 interferons appear to have positive immunoregulatory effects in autoimmune disease such as multiple sclerosis. But I have to say that the mechanisms still aren't clarified as to how uh, type 1 interferons mediate their beneficial effects in MS. So again, just to bring home this point that most cells in the central nervous system are capable of producing type 1 interferons in response to a viral infection is illustrated here from a study from uh, Peter Steely's group in which they used an interferon beta reporter mouse with the luciferase gene and looked at the question of what cells in the brain produce interferon beta um, following infection with uh, this virus, lacrosse virus. And they then infected these animals. They then looked at the luciferase activity in, cell, uh, in tissue sections sorry, that were co-stained for different markers of uh, CNS cells. So GFAP marks astrocytes. F480 is a marker, of course, for myeloid cells. In the case of the brain, the brain myeloid cell is the microglia. And nu N is a marker for neurons. And you can see here that luciferase acti activity corresponding to these different cell types is clearly um, evident, indicating that these cells are the source of interferon beta in this infection. Interestingly enough, a paper uh, from Van Hetteren and colleagues published in GLIA back in 2008 showed that in AGS or Akade Gutierrez syndrome, that astrocytes are in fact the major source of interferon alpha. And this is illustrated here again in this dual label immunofluorescence where they stain for interferon alpha in green and GFAP in red. And you can see here higher magnification in this inset, an astrocyte that's producing interferon alpha. They also looked at CXCL10. This is a chemokine that's part of the interferon signature. It's an interferon regulated gene. And similarly, they showed that the downstream uh, interferon regulated genes appear to be also upregulated in these astrocytes as according to this dual label uh, immunohistochemistry. Another gene that they looked at, uh, product that they looked at was the IL-6 cytokine. It's not known to be elevated in uh, brain tissue from patients with Akade Gutierrez syndrome and did not appear to be present in the brains of these animals or co-localized to astrocytes. So that's just a little bit of a rushed background. I'm cognizant of trying to stay on time. Um, we wanted to know what's the neurological impact 
of interferon alpha in the, second, in the central nervous system and, and what are the mechanisms of action of this. And at the time we embarked on these studies, we decided to use a model for localised interferon production in the CNS. Therefore, we took a, a transgenic approach, which is illustrated in this particular slide. So what we did was we took the glial fibrillary acidic protein promoter and used this to target the production of mouse interferon alpha-1 to the CNS of mice. GFAP is, um, as I indicated, a specific marker for the astrocyte. The GFAP gene has been used extensively by our own group and, and other groups for generating transgenic mice with astrocyte-targeted uh, transgene exp expression. Um, it is an appropriate cell to target in this context, as I just showed you that in Akade Goudier syndrome, it, it appears that astrocytes are the principal source of interferon alpha. So we developed um, two independent lines, so-called GIFN-12 and the GIFN-39 lines. And these lines differed in the levels of transgene-encoded interferon alpha production in the brain. The GIFN-12 animals had low expression, whereas the GIFN-39 animals had higher expression. And the GIFN-39 animals showed a, quite a severe phenotype with onset from one month of age. These animals were moribund. Whoop, they showed ataxia. Um, they had seizures. And they usually um, succumb by around five to six months of age. In contrast, these low expressor GIFN-12 animals uh, really don't show any significant physical signs until uh, are greater than eight months of age, and it's a much milder uh, phenotype that these animals display. So there appears to be a transgene dose-dependent uh, action in the brains of these mice. Again, I, I won't um, labour this point. It's just to illustrate that we can show the CNS-specific production of the transgene in mice uh, in these GIFN-12 and GIFN-39 mice compared with peripheral organs in this um, old RNAs protection assay for interferon alpha-1. We can show production of the biological and immunoreactive type 1 interferon in astrocytes in culture taken from the brains of these GIFN-39 mice compared with wild-type litter mates. And then finally, we've shown that the level of interferon transgene expression in the CNS of these transgenic mice is equivalent to what you see in the brain of animals that are infected with the neurotropic virus, in this case, MHV. And you can see here interferon alpha-1 and interferon beta, and just compares with the levels of um, interferon present in the GIFN-12 brain. So the levels are within a pathophysiologic range rather than a supraphysiologic range. These animals have a uh, very strong interferon response signature in the brain. This is evidence from activation of the signal transduction pathway with uh, chronic activation of STAT1. You'll recall that that's one of the downstream signal transduction factors that's activated via if, uh, engagement of the IFNAR with ligand. We also see activation of STAT3, interestingly enough. These animals show a very strong interferon signature. We can see a number of uh, prototypic interferon-regulated genes, protein kinase R, interferon-stimulated gene 15, interferon regulatory factor 7, and CXCL10, all markedly upregulated in the brain of the GFAP interferon alpha mice compared with wild type. We've also crossed these animals onto IFNA knockouts and you see that the gene signature, the interferon signature is not present in the brains of these uh, GFAP interferon alpha mice that are unable to respond to type 1 interferon, confirming the specificity of the effects that we're seeing in the brains of these mice. Furthermore, if we look by in situ hybridization at the localization of these interferon-regulated genes, what we see is that neurons are a predominant cellular expressor um, and target for type 1 interferon in the brains of these uh, transgenic animals. So what goes on in the brain of these animals? As I said, the GIFN-39 animals in particular, from about a month of age, uh, lose 
weight, their animals become moribund, they have seizures, they have ataxia, and then they uh, die prematurely. Well, what we see in the brains of these animals is actually quite dramatic. Um, this is illustrated here in terms of calcification in the brain of these animals. These are wild type. These are um, the transgenic animals. These brain sections were stained with alizarin red S, which um, binds to insoluble calcium and just highlights the presence both within the cerebellum but also the thalamus of these mice of uh, significant accumulation of calcium crystals. And you can actually see at higher magnification here these crystals. And there appears to be also more diffuse uh, calcium deposition. And it turns out that these crystals are made up of predominantly calcium phosphate. So there's very significant calcification of the brain. There's chronic inflammation. We see uh, the infiltration of the brain with CD4 T cells, uh, lower numbers of CD8 T cells, but also B cells. There's marked activation of the microglia in the brain, these tissue resident macrophages of the central nervous system compared with the wild type. There's also significant activation of the cerebrovascular endothelium as evidenced here by increased ICAM-1 compared with the wild type animals. And we see progressive neurodegeneration uh, in the CNS of these mice. And this is just illustrated here in the case of the hippocampus stained for choline acetyl transferase. This is the dentate gyrus here in the hippocampus. You can see very strong staining in wild type, which has almost disappeared in these transgenic animals. And this is just quantified here where there's a significant loss of these um, choline acetyl transferase neurons as well as other neurons. And I'll just point you to these structures here. This is an interesting observation that we made in these animals. They have these very large thin-walled vessels. This is actually not an artifact of a section. This is the remains of one of these very large thin-walled vessels. These animals have a, a very marked vasculopathy. And it was only more recently doing um, um, Araldite casting and electron microscopy of the vasculature of these mice that we were able to determine that these are actually aneurysms that are forming at the ends of the, uh, the vessels in the brain. And it's very spectacular when you look at it. So this vasculopathy obviously is going to have a marked impact on, on the degenerative processes in these animals. Just another interesting feature of these mice, um, something that was described a long time ago in relation to systemic injection of animals with the interferon and analyzing the effects of that at the EM level. And we see these unusual crystalline arrays present within various cell types. This is actually an astrocyte. These are glial fibrillary acidic protein fibers here. So we know that's an astrocyte. But these um, structures, these crystalline arrays are tubuloreticular inclusions. Um, and in Studies of MS and some other autoimmune diseases, it was observed many years ago that there were the presence of these crystalline arrays and they were mistakenly thought to be viral particles within the cell. But in fact, they're not viral particles. They're actually a char characteristic intracellular feature of uh, cells that are exposed to type 1 interferons. And we're really not sure what these arrays are made of or what their function is. This is just some calcium here, as you can see with this arrowhead. But what this slide illustrates uh, here and here is this tremendous elaboration of the intracellular membranes of the cells in, in these, uh, the brains of these mice. And these membranes are associated with a massive expansion of the endoplasmic reticulum, but also uh, very bizarre structures called confronting cystinal uh, rays that appear to be closely associated with the mitochondrion. And then finally, this just shows an axon that's pretty well stuffed uh, with insoluble, what we think is the beginnings of calcification occurring within that particular axon. So these um, GFAP interferon alpha mice develop a chronic progressive inflammatory encephalopathy. We're currently studying the mechanisms of how interferon mediates these effects, but it's clear that there are probably both direct and indirect mechanisms that lead to significant neuronal injury and death in these animals. And I've already mentioned the functional deficits that these animals have in terms of 
um, seizures and um, ataxia, but we've also shown in behavioural tests that these animals are significantly impaired, both um, in classic behavioural tests as well as electrophysiologically. So these studies told us that um, production of interferon alpha in the brain, at least in these transgenic mice, is uh, not good, not good for the mouse. But as I told you, type 1 interferons play a key role in antiviral defense. So we went on to ask whether these mice are protected from viral infection. The virus that we study uh, quite a bit in the lab is lymphocytic chorimeningitis virus, Armstrong strain. LCMV infection of immunocompetent wild-type mice uh, leads to rapid clearance of the virus. It really has um, no ill effects on a normal immunocompetent mouse. This clearance is mediated by antiviral CD8 T cells. So this is when you inject the virus intraperitoneally. If you inject the virus intracranially, however, into uh, immunocompetent mice, about a week later, these animals uh, die. And this is due to a lethal neurological disease that's mediated by the antiviral CD8 T cells. So we asked whether the GFAP interferon alpha mice were protected from lymphocytic chorimeningitis virus infection, and the answer to this was yes. If we look here at this curve, a wild type, uh, group of wild-type mice infected with LCMV, these animals all succumb by about a week. However, the low-expressing GIFN-12 animals show considerable resistance to this lethal viral infection, again by in situ hybridization to localize the lymphocytic chorea meningitis virus nuclear protein, mes uh, RNA, sorry. You can see in the GFAP interferon mice a significant reduction in the amount of virus and it's spread within the brain compared with wild type. And this is just reflected by the amount of uh, viral titers present in the brain at day three and day six compared with the wild type. We looked at the antiviral CTL activity and we showed that the antiviral CTL activity in the transgenic animals was similar to the amount of activity present in the wild type. So the defect that we see here in the protection is clearly not due to a loss of CD8 T cell antiviral response and uh, reflects the antiviral properties of the type 1 interferon. We've gone on to show that this also occurs in um, herpes simplex virus infection. So these GFAP interferon alpha transgenic mice have proven to be extremely informative. Um, we've now shown that these animals develop uh, significant molecular, cellular, and clinical changes, and yet they're also protected from viral infection. So how does this fit with the Cardet-Goutier syndrome? Well, we believe that these mice actually provide proof of principle that interferon alpha is the key driver of the clinical and the pathologic changes that occur in a Cardet-Goutier syndrome. And I've just put in this table a comparison of the clinical features and the pathological features. And you can see that the GFAP interferon alpha mice are very, very representative of what occurs in AGS. So I believe that these animals, as I said, provide proof of concept that this, in fact, is uh, an interferonopathy, AGS. And uh, hopefully our transgenic mice will prove to be valuable now in better understanding the principal mechanisms that, that drive this uh, devastating neurological or inflammatory encephalopathy. So this brings me to the final slide, which is really trying to put all of this together, the pathogenesis of the neurological interferonopathies. As I said, in AGS patients, this is a monogenic hereditary disorder in which patients have mutations in either TREX1, RNAs H2 genes, SAMHD1, or ADR1, and we believe that this leads to an accumulation of unprocessed self-nucleic acids or retroelements and or retroelements that activate nucleic acid sensors, driving the activation of innate signaling with production of interferon alpha, and this ultimately is detrimental to the CNS. Now, interestingly enough, as I've already mentioned, congenital viral infection has very similar clinical and pathologic outcomes as AGS, as does congenital infection with HIV. We believe that the viral nucleic acid likely activates a similar innate signaling pathway resulting in chronic interferon alpha production. And then finally, 
systemic autoimmune diseases such as SLE and likely others that are associated with mutations in TREX1 or other um, key nucleic acid uh, metabolizing uh, enzyme genes could also be explained by this pathway. These studies, of course, raise a number of important questions. Uh, we don't know the precise nucleic acid species that are involved in AGS, particularly in regard to these other mutations, although Deborah Barnes did show that in AGS fibroblasts there was an accumulation of self-single-stranded DNA. Uh, as far as I'm aware, um, we don't know uh, whether this occurs in the case of these other um, cases of AGS with these um, other mutations. Which sensors are involved? We don't know the particular or the specific DNA sensors that are responsible for detecting or sensing these aberrant nucleic acid species. Why is the disease specifically or, or predominantly a CNS disease? This is a major challenge in trying to understand in the context of this type of model. Again, we really don't have any grip on the uh, or answer to this question except to say that it may relate to alterations in the relative levels of retro elements that are generated in brain cells compared with the periphery in response to these mutations. We really don't know and obviously this is an area that will be under active investigation. Will therapies targeting interferon or some of these upstream pathways be effective in treating AGS? Yannick Crow has indicated to me that they're now uh, embarking on a clinical trial with antiretroviral drugs in children with AGS to see if they have a beneficial effect. But obviously, if retro elements play a key role at this level, then intervening with uh, retro antiretroviral drugs may actually have uh, a significant benefit to these children. And then finally, a question that we're primarily interested in, what are the mechanisms? How does interferon alpha drive all of these changes in the brain? What are the principal cell types that mediate these effects? I've shown you that type 1 interferon directly targets the neurons, so it's likely that neurons are victims uh, of this directly. But we believe that other phenomena that occur in the brains of these mice feed into the overall encephalopathy that these animals develop. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my talk. I'm sorry I did go over a little bit. I was hoping not to, but I believe that I'm going to be able to have lunch with um, the postgrads, which is great. You can ask me all the questions there. But otherwise, if people are, are willing and happy, I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank you very much. So we do have time for a couple of questions. There are Alex and Ben. Um, do you think that there is any merit perhaps in targeting the AGS genes in the context of viral reactivation therapy, perhaps for HIV? Um, uh, in the context of so To reactivate the, the late virus in order to um, completely clear it from patients, for instance? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, as I, I just mentioned, Yannick Crow is. Um, embarking upon trials now in AGS patients in which they're using antiretroviral drug therapy you know, to precisely uh, interfere with uh, that mechanism, if, if that's a key mechanism in AGS. But, I mean, would the reverse might be true as well? Perhaps you could treat HIV patients with inhibitors of the AGS genes in order to reactivate any latent virus that is there to completely cure the patient. I'm not quite sure I get the gist of that. Very good talk, yeah. Sorry. Hey, um, the, the observation that the TREX, the AGS disease, is is cured by deleting sting or or if not, is fascinating. But what happens in those mice? Uh, you, presumably, you've still got a build up of of the single strand nucleic acid. So you, I understand that evolution has provided you with receptors to detect those species, and that you drive an, an interferon response. 
Um, but if you take that away, if you get rid of that side of things, what, what are the physiological, the cellular effects of accumulating those species? Do they have other, do those mice get other pathologies? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, it, it's clear from the studies that were done with the Trex Ifna knockout mice, it protects the mice, it doesn't cure the mice. Um, it, in work done by Glenn Barber, it, it's apparent now that the sting pathways not only activate type 1 interferons, but also a number of other pro-inflammatory genes, and that's related to activation of other transcription factors, such as the NF-kappa B signaling pathway. And you don't knock those pathways out in the trex ifna mice. So there is a residual phenotype, and it's probably related to the activation of these other signaling pathways. I think it's also likely that, um, that um, that the single-stranded DNA is probably, or the retro elements are probably interacting with more than just a single DNA sensor, um, you know, and triggering other pathways as well. But it, it's a very good question. Um, as far as I understand, the phenotype, as I said, is not cured. The animals do have residual chronic um, pathology. But they're protected significantly in the absence of interferon signaling. But it's a really good question. I just have a quick question. So the calcification in the interferon um, transgenics is is calcification somehow a part of the antiviral response? Is that one imagines that's an antiviral yeah. response primarily? Yeah, it is. Um, and in uh, congenital viral encephalopathies, um, that's one of the cardinal features, um, calcification of the brain. Interestingly enough though, in, and, and um, HIV in associated dementia um, can, in infants leads to significant calcification of the brain, but it's not a characteristic of infection in adults. So there appears to be a difference in the way the, um, the neonatal brain responds to viral infection and the presence of type 1 interferon compared with the adult because you don't get this type of calcification which is not commonly seen in chronic viral infection of the adult brain. But any idea what it does, what it might do to mimic? I mean, what, what, what's the protective... Uh... Look, we don't even understand what's driving the calcification. Uh, we believe it's... You know, we hypothesise based on that EM that I showed you, the tremendous proliferation of the endoplasmic reticulum, that it's due to a disturbance in calcium metabolism and the cell's ability to um, to um, metabolise calcium because the endoplasmic reticulum is, plays a central role in. Uh, buffering the levels of intracellular calcium. Yeah. And we think that all of those changes in those intracellular membranes is probably disturbing cellular calcium levels, leading to very high levels of intracellular calcium and subsequent precipitation as calcium phosphate. <coughs> but it's just a hypothesis now. Oh, well, good day. Uh, as we are, sorry. You've got a chance to ask that question. That's all right. Go with ahead. That, is, uh, with that, thanks very much to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.